Hello and welcome to the 60th annual general meeting of Wiltshire Wildlife Trust. Uh, I'm Jo Lewis and I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce myself uh, as the new CEO of Wiltshire Wildlife Trust and to thank you uh, for the many messages I've had of support uh, and welcome as I take up the reins from the legendary Gary Mantle. Uh, but this evening is very much not my show to run. I'm going to hand over now to the chair of Wiltshire Wildlife Trust, Mark Street, to guide us through uh, this evening's proceedings. Mark. Thank you, Joe, um, and a warm welcome to everyone on the live stream from me as well. Uh, Mark Street, uh, I'm the chair of trustees. If you were at our AGM last year, you would have seen me. Uh, this year, we've decided to go online because we find that engagement within this AGM process is greater if we do online but uh, obviously we do respect members uh, who uh, may wish to put forward some uh, arguments to go back to a face-to-face -face. so um, we are in listening mode on that but hopefully this this online AGM will work well and we would propose to carry on using this format so we've got a, a, a really good um, opportunity to listen to a real expert later, but first there's some business to get to. As part of our uh, talk from Professor Dave Goulson later, we'll um, be allowing people to put questions up to Dave. The way to do that is through using a website called menti.com, um, which you go into on your computer. And on that, you enter a code, you can put your question in. And at that point, Joe will help to put those to Dave later. So um, that number will come up again just before the talk. I'll just give people a few seconds. If you've got a pen and a bit of paper, uh, just to write that down. OK, so. We're going to get into uh, the presentation of the annual accounts and review of the year. It's been another amazing year overall. Hopefully you've all had a chance to look at our impact report, um, which actually I think is, is a really good development. I was reading through some of the previous year's impact reports, well, annual reports, and I think this is the top one. I think our format's got really good. Hopefully it's clear and um, you can find out a lot more. We're not gonna go through all of those items that are in the impact report, but we will go through some highlights. So first is, um, I need to just confirm that the minutes of our 59th meeting uh, were proposed by Julian Barlow and seconded by Tim Gilson. The votes were cast 229 for, none against and 17 abstentions. So I can confirm that the minutes of last year were approved. And now I can move on to our financial position. So you would have had a chance to look at this slide. Uh, this is a record year for income, um, significantly higher than last year. And that is a challenging result. Um, it does stretch people and I really want to pay my respects to everyone who's been part of, of bringing in this level of income for the, for the Wildlife Trust. It does mean we can do more, but I know it puts a significant strain all the way through the organisation. It's also a really great result in terms of inflationary pressures, cost of living, the fact that we've had to address a significant amount of ash dieback across our reserves, and of course we're taking action to improve the environment in Wiltshire. So I'm really pleased to say that the Trust has remained resilient from an income point of view, down to the generosity of our members, our supporters, our grant-making bodies, and unrestricted income is critical for that. Um, and we will be looking to develop that even more in the coming year. But we think we really are helping to create a sustainable future for, for Wiltshire. So um, I'm really pleased. In our impact report, you can see the details of some of our particular donors. And I, and I would like to thank them a lot for what they do for us. We obviously um, use that income to good effect and you can see that in the impact report but I can also show this slide which basically identifies that we put 72 percent of our funding into our charitable activities there's a bit more of a breakdown in the in, in the annual report 
But in this year, we've also had a significant capital acquisition, which is Greatwood. It's our largest ever acquisition in one go of, a, of, a, of an ancient woodland. Really pleased about that and really pleased that the Heritage Lottery Fund could support us in doing that. So what you do see here is, a, is I think if you compare it to the year before, you see quite a considerable extra amount of investment going into capital. So the balance sheet shows again a strong financial position. You can see that our fixed assets have increased. And that's to do with the acquisition of Great Wood, new infrastructure at the Willows Care Farm, where we put in a fantastic new office. You'll see a little bit about later. Staff and volunteers have worked really hard um, on projects, including the Green Recovery Challenge Fund to enhance the, the, the trust's reserves and develop projects for landowners on their land. We must always continue to fundraise to secure our, the financial resource we need. And really that's to deliver our new 30 by 30 strategy. We're thankful especially to major donors and especially the Hills Group, our major supporters. This year, we celebrated 30 years of their support, including the opening of the new extended Brock Bank Centre. Of course, it's not possible without fantastic staff and volunteers and just whoever however you you work with the trust however you volunteer with the trust we all send from on behalf of the trustees a huge thank you for all the contributions you make a little bit of an extra note here um, but also th we're thrilled by the success of the wiltshire wildlife community energy company during this last year where they've been able to increase their support for local projects through the community fund. They've done award-winning work on energy cafes and um, have helped part fund the carbon reduction champion who works within the Wildlife Trust. So good, good work from the Wiltshire Wildlife Community Energy. I'd also just like to raise a particular end of project reference for building bridges. It's been going, it's an award-winning, double award-winning programme that we've had 10 years, sorry, over 10 years, sorry, it's 2016 it started, and this has helped people get back into work, and I think that's been a really important, it's a project that we've worked with Community First, which is a community organisation that works across Wiltshire, funded by the European, European Social Fund, and the National Lottery Community Fund. And really it's been a, a backbone project and it's helped a lot of people gain confidence and get back into work. So I really do appreciate what that has done over its time. So the next stage will be to uh, not listen to me anymore, but to go into our highlights of the year. And uh, when I click my mouse for the next time a video should start so here we go hello i'm joe lewis and i feel incredibly privileged to be taking over from gary mantle as the ceo of wiltshire wildlife trust i can imagine no more important role right now than leading by example for nature's recovery in a place like Wiltshire and proving how we can unlock the pace and the scale of change that we so urgently need on the ground. So the highlights for the water team this year have been the creation of this wetland complex at Lowermore Farm as well as the islands. We've also carried out a lot of woody habitat debris work across the rivers of Wiltshire, specifically at um, Biss Meadows near Trowbridge and on the River Avon in Fyldeen. The wetlands that we created at Lowermore Farm in October 2022 are designed to provide a lot of overwintering habitat for wading birds along with a lot of other species and the spoil from the diggings of these wetlands were put in Cottage Lake SI to create islands there, which will again provide a kind of marginal shelf for vegetation to grow and for things such as dragonflies and other insects to enjoy, as well as wading birds to um, feed from in the winter. The highlights here at Echo Lodge Meadows are the marsh artillery butterfly. And in order to increase their numbers, we've been working really hard to get Devil's Bit Scabious, which is their food plant, across the rest of the reserve. So as you can see behind me, 
there is a beautiful Devil's Bit Scabious Meadow, but some of the other meadows don't have quite as much of the food plant, so we're looking to spread it across the reserve. The Marsh Fritillary Butterfly is a species that's gone through 66% decline since 1990. That They have to have very careful management of the habitat, so to achieve that we use our cattle which are grazing and we make sure that we don't have the cattle densities too high or too low and you also have to be really careful about cutting and heights of cutting for the vegetation. Here at Bay Meadows, next to Marlborough, we've created a fantastic new nature reserve that straddles the River Og, which is a beautiful chalk stream that forms a wildlife corridor running through the North Wessex Downs. Bay Meadows is both a nature park and a wildlife reserve. The beauty of Bay Meadows is inspirational for all the local community who come here. People can take a paddle in the stream to cool down when it's hot. They can wander along the river, see the wildlife. People can also come here for well-being activities that are led by our experts. In the wildlife refuge, we've created new habitat such as these wetland scrapes, which are fantastic for wading birds. And we've introduced cattle grazing, which helps and encourages many more wildflowers to grow. And we've also planted thousands of trees. For the past two years we have been working as part of a large collaboration with Avon Wildlife Trust and Entrade um, thanks to funding from the Green Recovery Challenge Fund to develop and create uh, an online marketplace called the Bristol Avon Catchment Market. The Bristol Avon Catchment Market essentially looks to provide the opportunity for landholders to create new nature-based projects on their land um, and diversify. diversify their income stream and on the other side of the market it brings forward ethical businesses an opportunity to buy the environmental services that they might require to meet their environmental goals. We've already run the first uh, online biodiversity market within the UK and successfully settled that market round seeing lots of new projects created so we're currently working on our second market round and developing a whole new pipeline of projects. As part of this work we really wanted to trial agroforestry because of the many benefits that it brings into um, particularly farm systems um, and in-field cropping systems. So agroforestry is, is essentially the introduction of trees and hedgerows and shrubs back into the, into the landscape. So in the scheme that we have at Mill Farm we've actually looked at bringing in rows of apple trees. So they're semi-dwarf apple trees with about 1.5 hectares of uh, wildflower enhanced grassland underneath. And for us, the excitement around agroforestry is that it can offer so much in terms of supporting not only biodiversity, but also climate. WSBRC are the environmental data hub, really, for uh, Wiltshire and Swindon. And we're basically the custodians of species, habitats and site data um, for the whole of the county. We've been storing that since 1974. Uh, we analyse it, process it, clean it up. Uh, and basically make it available to a whole variety of different people. Highlights over the last year, well, there's been a lot of project work we've been able to uh, get involved with, um, such as uh, the Nurturing Nature project. We've, we've developed a new uh, relationship with the Cranbourne Chase AOMB. That's really led to a lot of work, particularly uh, a big project for uh, the Chalk and Chase Landscape Partnership. Um, and that aims to uh, kind of recruit, train, and uh, volunteers and then take them out into the countryside and, and do some uh, do some re biological recording. Anna, our project officer who's been doing that, has uh, recently won an award from uh, the New Forest Environment Award. The main purpose of the Critical Species Project was to come up with a, a list of species that are really important to Wiltshire or, or the, look at the, the other way around, that, are, that Wiltshire is really important to them. We got down to about 132 species that are of critical importance for Wiltshire. 
and uh, the data from that project is available on our website. Uh, we've also progressed some other exciting projects like the Ancient Woodland Inventory. As the Trust's Ancient Woodland Specialist, I have been mapping all of the ancient woodlands in Wiltshire. And my research shows that Great Woods has a history that goes back many centuries. We have maps demonstrating that the footprint of the wood was the same in the 1700s. But what's really key is that this provided excellent habitat conditions for a variety of rare species. This year we have been doing all of our forest school work with children all across Wiltshire. Uh, all ages of children that we take out weekly for sessions. So we take out lots of one-to-one -one children that have complex needs. In addition to that, we also work with classes and we've worked with over 5,000 children in the last year, taking them out, learning about nature and helping with their well-being. We also have had a really exciting project this last year, working with a group of 12 students from a local secondary school. So they've been doing lots of nature crafts and learning about their heritage. Langford Lakes and Lermore Farm are our flagship nature reserves, so we deliver lots of education workshops there and they have fantastic facilities with ponds that we can do pond dipping, woodland areas and we've been working a lot also to make it more accessible because we have some young people with some significant and profound disabilities. One of the main goals of the U team is to help encourage as many people to get outside as possible and to live more sustainable lifestyles, but also to encourage schools to improve their school grounds for biodiversity. For me, the highlights of both care farms over the last academic year have been the fact that students have been able to re-engage with education, they've built trusting relationships, they have a space that is calm and safe. They've managed social interactions by having one-to-one -one support workers. We've been able to help them make meaningful friendships and some of these children have been out of education for a long time. What's new at the Willows is our wonderful new building which houses the staff room and the office. We've also got a new pond dipping platform and that's opened up nature activities for our young people and they've been really engaged with pond dipping and looking at the wildlife living in the pond. Here at Malden Hill you can see in the background all this thick dense scrub. Over the last two three years we've cleared that down and we've created these meadow glades within this full of pyramidal orchids, full of agrimony. Um, there's some wild carrot I can see amongst us, some scabious just over here. And these wildflowers have just come up. We've not seeded anything here. It's just clearing back that scrub. And we've been doing this all over Swindon. This is an area of a country park that was pretty much no go. We get lots and lots of comments from people who can now walk through here, see the results of what we're doing. The project is a partnership between ourselves, Swindon Borough Council, and in particular, the Great Western Community Forest. Swindon Borough, the Great Western Community Forest, have extended that partnership in the last year. And we're looking for five years of further work, further volunteers, further effort across Swindon Borough on sites like this. Our team provide uh, opportunities for local people to improve their mental well-being through connecting to nature. So our team take people out to local nature reserves and green spaces. We help people to connect to nature through activities like mindfulness in nature, uh, wildlife walks, practical conservation and arts and crafts in nature. Over the last year we've just completed our sixth year of working with people in Swindon We've just had new funding from the Armed Forces Covenant Fund Trust to work with Armed Forces Veterans, a new project that we've got running in Trowbridge at our Green Lane Wood Nature Reserve. This year we've started to use the Five Pathways to Nature Connectedness, which is a framework developed by the University of Derby, all about sort of addressing moments, not minutes. So it's not just about time you spent in nature that helps people's well-being. It's about what you do when you're there, focusing in on the beauty that there is in our green spaces. The benefits of being in nature for people are, are huge. It has a massive impact. You can see almost as soon as people come out with us on groups, you can see them starting to relax. The feedback we get from people is phenomenal. We have people saying that they don't 
think they'd be here if it hadn't been for our groups. In a, in a year upcoming we've got some exciting new projects, uh, in particular we're going to be working closely with the Harbour Project in Swindon, funded by the Community Foundation and we'll be working with asylum seeker families, taking them out to local green spaces and helping them to realise that these spaces are also for them. Wiltshire Wildlife Trust has launched a new strategy to achieve a wilder Wiltshire by 2030, building on all the ideas of our incredible members and their wider communities from a big consultation we held last year. We've set ourselves three headline goals. The first goal is that by 2030, nature will be in recovery. 30% of land across Wiltshire and Swindon will be managed for nature in line with global commitments and nature-friendly farmers everywhere will be given the support that they so deserve. Our second goal is that by 2030, one in four people will be empowered to take meaningful action for nature, and crucially, that every child will have the opportunity to experience the joy of nature in a way that can spark a lifelong interest. Wiltshire Wildlife Trust has shown so powerfully how nature therapy can turn young lives around with our incredible care farms uh, like Lakeside Care Farm here at Lower Moor Nature Reserve. Our third and final goal is that nature will be valued by key decision makers and nature-based solutions like new woodlands and wetlands will be playing a key role in tackling the climate emergency. There's so much that Wiltshire Wildlife Trust can and must achieve in the next seven years but we can't do it without your help. So a huge thank you to all of you, whether as members or volunteers, partners, supporters, funders. When we achieve nature's recovery in Wiltshire and Swindon, it will be thanks to you. Well, welcome back, everyone. That was an amazing run through. Thank you, everyone involved with creating that amazing video. Uh, we'll now carry on with our business. The first item now is the adoption of the annual reports and accounts. I confirm that they are proposed by myself and seconded by Charlie Fatterini. I can confirm that we've had votes in of 236 for, none against, and 10 abstentions. So the annual report, impact report, and accounts are approved. So I now go on to the appointment of auditors. This is summer audit. Are proposed as a trust auditors for the coming year. They're proposed by Piers Maynard and seconded by Sylvia Wyatt. The votes are as follows, 225 for, three against and 18 abstentions. So I can confirm that summer audit have been confirmed as a trust auditors for this year. The next item is the election of offices. The first thing I need to do is to um, hand, well, sorry, first thing I need to do is just uh, express my thank you to Peter Luck and Martin Allies, who have stepped down as trustees in 2023. I, uh, we, we do really appreciate all the work that they've done over the years that they've been volunteering as trustees. Now I need to hand over to Lou just to confirm um, my position as chair for the coming year. Lovely. Thank you, Mark. Um, so Mark has agreed to stand as a trustee for another year. Uh, this is to support Joe and provide some continuity for the trust. Um, so Mark is proposed by Charlie Fatterini and seconded by Sylvia Wyatt. Members have cast their votes as 239 for, one against and six abstain. 
So Mark is elected as a trustee for another year. So thank you very much, Mark. Good. Thank you, Lou. The next uh, appointment is uh, that Charlie Fatterini has um, uh, undertaken his first three years as a trustee. And under the articles, uh, we have to reappoint at that point. And Charlie will be standing for election for a second term. So Charlie is proposed by myself and seconded by Cora. Members have cast their votes and I can confirm 234, four and four against with eight abstentions. I can confirm Charlie is re-elected as a trustee. And then we have some, some new faces uh, and they're all on our Zoom call. Um, Richard, Phil and Dagmar, if you just just wave to those people who have joined us on on YouTube. That would be wonderful. So, um, Richard is proposed by Charlie Fatterini, seconded by Sylvia, and the numbers of votes are as follows: two hundred and twenty-three four and and four against, and nineteen abstentions. So, Richard is elected as a trustee. Phil is proposed by Fiona and seconded by Cora, and the votes are 232 for, three against, and 11 abstentions. can confirm that Phil is elected as a new trustee. And then Dagmar is proposed by myself, Mark Street, seconded by Tim Gilson. I can confirm that the votes are 231 for, one against, and 14 abstentions. And so Dagmar, welcome. You are now elected as a trustee and I'd like to express my thanks to everyone who voted on that. Okay, so now I'm going to begin to hand over. I said um, we'd just have a moment where the code reappeared and here it is. But firstly, let me uh, say a really big welcome to Professor Dave Goulson. Uh, I know you've been instrumental in a number of areas of work with the Wildlife Trust as, as an ambassador, your own work with the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, uh, your work with the uh, biological department at the University of Sussex. You've written some amazing books um, and uh, have inspired me personally to, to look very differently at my garden at home uh, something I know a lot of people in Wiltshire really love and at the size whatever size of garden you have is always something you can do um, and uh, really importantly Dave was involved with the production of a report in 2019 which was called Action for Insects and that was set up by the Southwest Wildlife Trust and, and really sort of highlighted the challenges that we face uh, over our insects, which are really a fundamental part of all of the ecology of, of this county and obviously the world. So I'm going to uh, pause my share and Dave, hopefully you can um, start yours. Thank you, Mark. I, okay, just bear with me a second while I share my screen. There we go. I hope that <laughs> uh, you can now all see a rather lovely bumblebee uh, and the cover of my most recent book. Sorry for the blatant book plug. So um, this evening I'm going to be uh, talking about insects, as you've, as you've gathered. Kind of my favourite subject. I've been obsessed by insects all my life uh, since I was only five or six years old. And I don't really know why, but I, I do remember searching for caterpillars around the school playing field when I was at primary school and taking these poor creatures home in my lunchbox. And I think most of them died, but occasionally and eventually I managed to work out what to feed them. And uh, and some of them turned into, into moths and I, I just was absolutely entranced. I thought it was kind of magic. And I'd been lucky enough to, to make a, a career out of chasing around after insects, which is a real privilege. Um, but I don't think I was actually that weird. I think given half a chance, most children uh, love insects and they love to hold them in their hand and and look at them, give them names, keep them in a jam jar or whatever. Um, 
this is this is not me obviously this is my, but it's my youngest son Seth uh picture taken three or four years ago but um he's still in his insect phase thankfully but here he is with his pet cockchafer Colin um sadly Colin's no longer with us but uh um uh but as I say I think most children given the the opportunity find insects interesting and fascinating but sadly by the time they're adults or even teenagers most people have grown out of that insect phase if they ever had it and they they become frightened of insects their reaction if anything comes near them if any insect buzzes by is usually fear and thrashing around trying to kill it which is just terribly sad and and that negative attitude i think is is captured rather well by this sign uh I, this photograph was taken on the university of south wales campus uh last summer and uh, at the top half is in Welsh, obviously. Um, but the, the English translation, warning, flying insects in this area, as if you should run for your life at the sight of a flying insect. Um, how bonkers is that? You know, what kind of message does it send to people about insects? Um, actually, all this was was some swarming ants, um, which, um, as I'm sure you know, are completely harmless. Um, so why they bothered with this, I have no idea. But anyway, it seems rather sad to me because because I hope you'll agree. Insects are amazing creatures. They're extraordinarily diverse. They're, they're really ancient, actually. The first insects appeared uh, about 480 million years ago, um, which is twice as long ago as the first dinosaurs, um, which means they've had lots of time. They've had time to, to speciate. Um, into, well, so far we've named about 1.1 million species of insect, which means they make up about 70% of all known species on our planet. And what's really mind-boggling is, is that we think um, there are maybe four or five or six million more that we haven't even discovered yet. Uh, so we haven't yet discovered the majority of life on our, on our own planet. Um, insects have survived five mass extinction events, all of the mass extinction events that went before. Um, but sadly now they they are in trouble and and it's a, it's down to us, unfortunately. Um, now I don't want to dwell too much on the depressing side of things, but there's pretty clear evidence that insects have undergone major declines in, in recent decades. Uh, one of the most dramatic studies was actually not from the UK, but from Germany. And it's, it's shown here, it's based on, well, the data are shown here. Um, this was a study done by German insect enthusiasts using malaise traps, which is that funny tent-like thing, to catch flying insects. And it catches all sorts of flying insects. And they put these traps on nature reserves all across Germany. And uh, what the chart shows you is the, the biomass that, of insects caught per trap per day from 1989 to 2016, so it's a 27-year period. And in that time, um, the, the, the biomass of insects caught fell by 76% on average. So seemingly three quarters of the insects disappeared from, the flying insects disappeared from German nature reserves in, in a quarter of a century, which is pretty terrifying. Um, and uh, we have other lines of evidence suggesting this isn't just something really weird happening in, in Germany. Uh, I'll give you one UK example. Um, so I, my speciality are bumblebees. I've been uh, uh, studying bumblebees for the last 30 years. And this is one of, the, one of my favourites. The shrill carder has a high-pitched buzz, hence the name. Uh, beautiful little bee. Um, and as you can see from the distribution map there, pre-1960, it was, it was pretty widespread. It was actually fairly common in the southern half of Britain um, in the first half of the 20th century. But as time went on, um, as with many of our species, it, it, its numbers dwindled. And by, by the turn of the millennium, um, it was down to about six populations. Now, in, in 2000, I went looking for this bee. I'd never seen one. And I, 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 you know, wanted to find out more about them. At the time, I was at the University of Southampton, so the nearest population I could identify 
was on Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire. Um, and I actually spent a summer every day when it wasn't raining, driving up to the plain and searching for shrill carder bumblebees. A lovely experience, I have to say, an amazing place. And I did find a few shrill carder bumblebees, only I think three or four in a whole summer of searching. Um, uh, but I did, did get terribly excited when I caught the first one. Um, anyway, the, the, sadly, that population has gone extinct. There are no shrill carders left uh, on Salisbury Plain or in Wiltshire, so far as anyone knows. Um, and more recently, the one on the Somerset levels seems to be uh, more or less gone. Um, it's, there's only been a, a handful of bees seen in recent years. So the shrill carder is disappearing before our eyes. Um, you know, this has gone from being a common insect when I was born to, to a species that could disappear completely within five or ten years if we if this carries on. So this has happened on my watch, on our watch. It's it's and it's ongoing. It's not something that happened in the past and that we've fixed. It's still happening. Um, which which should worry us. Um so most people haven't really noticed any of this stuff. Um, most people don't pay the slightest bit of attention to insects. But anyone over the age of about, I think, about 40 years old um, will know immediately what this picture is about, um, which is there was a time um, a few decades back when if you drove anywhere in the summer, you had to stop every now and again to clean your windscreen because it was it became opaque with with splatted insects poor creatures um but of course today it just doesn't happen certainly not in in the uk um uh, the the cartoonist i came across this quite recently has extrapolated into the future as to what the consequences might be and uh uh yeah well we, and it, the, the reason he's done that is because of course we do need insects whether we like them or not insects are are really important uh, directly to us uh, and to many other creatures that we might care about more than we do about insects. So insects are really uh, a major food source for larger creatures like many species of birds and bats and uh, reptiles, amphibians and freshwater fish like trout and salmon um, all feed uh, on insects. So um, if the insects go, then these creatures will, will disappear too. Insects aren't just important as food, they are um, involved in almost every ecological process you can think of um, on land or in fresh water. Um, they're really important biocontrol agents, things like ladybirds and hoverflies and lacewings and so on. They're really important in recycling, recycling dung and dead bodies and tree trunks and leaves and so on, which helps to keep the soil healthy and provides nutrients to plants. Uh, and they distribute seeds, the, you name it, they do it. And most of this goes on without any appreciation from the majority of us humans. Most, most of us never stop to think about the value of dung beetles, for example. They're not particularly glamorous little creatures. But what they do is, is really vital. I think the one um, thing that insects do for us that is widely appreciated, of course, is, is, is this one. Um, most people now, I think, are aware that insects pollinate. They, they certainly um, are aware that bees pollinate. Um, I think they wrongly, many people think that pollination is all done by bees. Uh, sometimes they think there's just one species of bee and it pollinates everything, which is a long way from the truth, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, anyway, the reality is the pollination is done by thousands of species of insects. Even in the UK, it's estimated there are about 6,000 species of insect that contribute to pollination. Bees, butterflies, uh, moths, wasps, lots of flies, uh, beetles and so on, and all of them helping to ensure that our beautiful wildflowers set seed. 80% of all the plant species on the planet need insects to pollinate them. And... 75% of the of, of the crops that we grow wouldn't give a good harvest without insect pollinators. So, um, you know, we've become used to our supermarkets being replete with this amazing selection of, of foods, often flown in from around the world and available 12 months of the year. Um, if we didn't have pollinators, they wouldn't be looking so rosy. Um, we would have far fewer 
apples, cherries, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, uh, pumpkins, tomatoes, you name it. Um, even things like coffee and uh, chocolate are insect pollinated. So imagine a world without those. Doesn't bear thinking about, does it? Um, so we do need to look after insects for selfish reasons because we need them. Um, and I, I've trotted this argument out many times, and I, I believe it to be true. It is, it's, it's obviously true. But I, in recent years, I've started to think it maybe isn't the most powerful argument. Um, uh, or at least it, it worries me, because it's not really what doesn't encapsulate why I care about insects. I just think they're kind of cool and beautiful and deserve looking after for their own sake. And it does slightly worry me that if we justify looking after insects because they pollinate our crops and keep the soil healthy and so on, then what about the ones that don't do that? There's probably loads of insects that aren't doing anything valuable to us. Do we just let them all die? Don't they matter? Um, so to give you an example, um, this is the St. Helena giant earwig, the biggest earwig that ever lived. Uh, 84 millimetres long, or so what's that, about three and a half inches. It's a whopper of an earwig. I wish I'd seen one, but sadly I never will, um, because they're extinct. They, they were only ever found on St. Helena in the South Atlantic, tiny little island. They lived in seabird colonies. We think they were all eaten by the rats that we accidentally brought to the island. They haven't been seen since the 1960s now, so they're pretty certainly gone. Um, they didn't do anything important, so far as we know. Um, they just quietly went extinct. Um, but it seems to me the world is a, a much sadder place for not having a giant earwig, even if none of us were ever going to go and, and see it. Um, uh, so I think we should look after insects for their own sake. We should respect them. We should we should respect all life on our planet and and um, and and feel a mo I think is the most powerful species, which is doing a lot of damage. We we have a kind of moral duty to look after creatures, whether they're useful to us or not, I would say. So what can we do? Um, well, the good news is most insects haven't got extinct and there's lots and lots of things we can do. Um, I, as was uh, mentioned by Mark earlier, the Wildlife Trust's asked me to write a report about insect declines and why they matter that was published, I think, in 2019. And then we followed that up uh, that was that was commissioned by the Southwest Wildlife Trusts, and then we followed that up by uh, the second report there in 2020, which is reversing the decline of insects, which showcased some really nice examples of things that were going on um, around the country um, to to support insects, with the hope, obviously, of inspiring more people to get involved in in doing that. And one of the examples we gave was from Wiltshire. It was the the, the work of the Wiltshire Wildlife uh, Trust water team in uh, restoring some of your chalk streams, which are, of course, a, a fantastically rare, internationally rare habitat that's really rich in, in insect life. Um, it's been really nice, actually, to see, you know, what I've been interested in insects all my life, as I explained, but actually um, most conservation bodies focus or have historically focused on larger creatures, birds and and mammals and so on and, uh, and and rarely paid much attention to insects it's been brilliant to see that change and the Wiltshire Wildlife Trust have been busy since those reports came out they got a green recovery challenge fund uh, project uh, taking action for insects which has involved doing lots of things um, which I won't try to talk you through because I've not been personally involved in in them but it, it seems to me that there are three broad kind of areas that we could think about in terms of how we protect biodiversity. Um, we obviously need to look after our protected areas and ideally expand the number of protected areas. I'm a big fan of rewilding projects as one way we might do that. Not everyone's cup of tea. Um, but then secondly, it's really important that we need to work with farmers. We need to, to support farmers in moving to more nature-friendly farming methods uh, so that the nature reserves aren't surrounded by completely hostile landscapes. Um, yeah, just to, to, as an aside, just remember back that German study that was done on nature reserves. And it kind of shows that on their own, nature reserves haven't been effective at preserving insects. They've disappeared even in the protected areas. 
Um, anyway, so we need to look at we need to support nature friendly farming. And then finally, I think there's some some easy wins to be had and a lot of lot to be said for promoting um, biodiversity conservation in urban areas. And it's really nice to, to say that Wiltshire Wildlife Trust is involved in all three of those those areas. Um, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus on the last one because it's something that I think we can all get involved in. You know, um, most of us don't have a farm or a, a, an estate where we can create substantial areas of habitat for insects, but many of us do have a garden, even and even if it's a small garden, it's surprising how many different species of insect you can encourage. And I have this kind of slightly crazy, optimistic dream that not long from now, most gardens might be nature friendly, pesticide free, full of wildflowers with a little pond and a, a shaggy unmown lawn and, and a few other simple things that you can do to encourage wildlife. And there are 22 million gardens in Britain covering about 400,000 hectares of land, which is a bigger area than all of our national nature reserves. And just imagine if they were all wildlife friendly. And better still, if we could link the, them up by badgering the council to create wildlife areas in parks and cemeteries and along road verges and roundabouts and so on, and make a national network of, of insect-friendly habitat. Um, I think that would be brilliant. Um, also, of course, as well as actually doing something significant for insects, it prov that approach provides a, a, a an opportunity for us all to reconnect with nature, to bring nature into our gardens, into our cities, so that children in the future grow up being familiar with bumblebees and butterflies rather than being frightened of them. At least that's the dream. Um, I've written books about this. Sorry to plug my books again. Um, uh, or if you can't be bothered to buy my books, and I don't blame you, then um, there's lots of, I've made lots of YouTube videos about things you can do in your in your garden. If you don't have a garden, badger the council to do some of these things in your uh, in your local park or uh, to reduce road verge cutting and all those kinds of things. Anyway, so gardening, I think, it, it, uh, and the future of gardening is a really interesting area. While many of us are busy trying to make our gardens wilder places, more biodiverse places, not everybody's got the message, it must be said. Um, and horrifically, um, there was a recent report that 8% of British gardens now have plastic lawns, believe it or not. How horrific is that? What is going on? You can even look at this, 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 that. I took that photograph myself last year. That's a plastic hedge. Um, I mean, I don't know where to start. It just illustrates, again, a bit like the, the, the red and white warning sign earlier, this disconnect from nature, you know. That people think that that's a perfectly acceptable thing to do. I guess the hedge, the, the box hedge there isn't going to be affected by box moth, but really just, just I came across in a garden centre recently, um, you can now buy shampoo for your plastic lawn, which claims it will make it smell like a fresh cut flower meadow. How ironic is that? It's just a level of bonkersness that I can't get my head around. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm sure nobody here has a plastic lawn. I really hope not. Um, but probably if you're a keen gardener, you, you we're all, I know I am guilty of perhaps less obvious kind of environmental harms in what we do. Um, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of people's idea of gardening involves driving to a big garden center at the weekend and getting a trolley and filling it up with a load of annual bedding plants uh, in the spring. Um, grown in disposable plastic pots, probably in a peat-based compost, almost certainly treated with fertilizers and pesticides. And then you might get a sack of peat-based compost and put it in the bottom of your trolley and some Roundup to kill the weeds and some bug spray to kill the aphids on your roses. And you can see where I'm going. Um, there's, a, there's a whole industry devoted to persuading us to do things that aren't very good for the environment um, in the name of, of gardening. But on the other hand, gardens really can be amazing places for wildlife. And there's this lovely example from Leicester. Uh, where there was a lady called Jenny Owen. I say was, I'm not sure whether she's still alive or not. I haven't been able to find out, but she'd be quite old if she is. Anyway, she 
lived close to Leicester city centre, had an eighth of an acre garden and uh, rather obsessively spent 35 years cataloguing every species of um, of animal and plant that she could find in her garden. Um, and after 35 years, her species list was 2,673 in a little urban garden. I think that's astonishing. Uh, 1,997 of those were different types of insect. Um, so, you know, we can all have thousands of species, literally thousands of species living in our gardens, living right outside our back door, which I think is amazing. So how do we go about encouraging these creatures? How do we maximise the number of beasties that we can get into our gardens? I haven't got time, obviously. I've only got half an hour in total and I've got about 10 minutes or less left. I haven't got time to go into great detail at all, but a few key pointers. Firstly, plant native wildflowers where you can. Um, there are loads of beautiful native wildflowers that are really attractive to, um, to pollinators and look beautiful in their own right. You don't have to have an ugly garden full of nettles to have a, a wildlife rich garden. Um, there's good evidence. And one example is this study at the bottom of the screen here. Been a number of trials which show that native wildflowers tend on average to be better at attracting pollinators. Um, bees and such like the non-natives there are prominent exceptions but on average they're better but actually the real value of native plants is not for pollinators but for um, herbivorous insects things like the caterpillars of butterflies and moths that I collected as a kid um, as I learned pretty quickly when I tried to keep them in in jam jars if you feed them the wrong leaves they die Herbivorous insects um, are really fussy. They tend to eat only one species of plant or perhaps two or three closely related ones. And so here's a really nice example, the beautiful orange tip butterfly, uh, which will fly through your garden in spring. Um, but if, you're, if you grow lady smock in your garden, there's a really good chance the butterflies will stop and lay their eggs and you can watch their caterpillars developing and have your own little population of orange tips in your in your garden. Um, if you don't grow ladies smock or any, there's, they'll also lay their eggs on garlic mustard. Then you guarantee you won't ever find a caterpillar because that's the only thing that they'll they'll eat. And similarly, every native plant you include in your garden will support a handful of native insects. Um, and take it to an extreme if you've got room to plant a tree in your garden. If you um, plant a non-native like a, a eucalyptus, a gum tree then it will support absolutely nothing unless you've got a pet koala, it's useless. Um, if you plant an oak tree or a lime or an ash or whatever, a native deciduous tree, then eventually when it's big, it will support hundreds of species of insect and then all the birds that eat them and, and so on and so on. So, so where you can grow native plants, um, which brings me to the, to the subject of weeds, which, um, not everyone's cup of tea um but the, so here i've got three examples of of plants which most people would regard as kind of undesirable in the garden but actually they're all really attractive to to pollinators um they're really these are native wildflowers i don't know quite why we revile them so much um i have all of them growing in my garden and i think they're beautiful so you can get rid of all the weeds in your garden you know just just like that um, by calling them all wildflowers, because that's what they are. There's this, I came across this really interesting and lovely project in East London, which is trying to celebrate uh, the diversity of pavement weeds by chalking their names next to them on the pavement to try and get people to stop and and pay attention to the little plants that they that they normally just stand on. And um, this. This, as I say, was in, I think it was in East London, and the lady Sophie Legill that was doing this, she identified, I think, 47 different species of plant just growing in the cracks in the pavement. Uh, so we should look after our weeds and our native wildflowers more generally. What else can we do? An obvious one I have to mention while I'm talking about wildlife gardening is mowing and lawns. We don't need stripy Wimbledon tennis court style lawn management, mowing up and down in straight lines every weekend is bonkers. Um, if you just relax and instead of getting the mower out, um, get your deck chair out and make yourself a gin and tonic and sit and chill, 
it's a much better way to spend your time. And usually this is my lawn and I haven't sown any wildflowers. All sorts of beautiful flowers just pop up of their own accord, um, which is, I think, rather fantastic. Um, so, yes, mow less. And of course, it's not just in our gardens where this happens. The council are also guilty often of, of uh, excessive mowing. Often they'll pay for their teams to go out seven, eight times a year mowing road verges, which isn't really necessary at all. Our road verges could all look like that, just imagine. Um, and the roundabouts too, why not? And, and big areas in our parks and so on. And that would make a, a real difference. Instead, and you know, it's hugely variable between councils. It's brilliant to see that some have got on board and are practicing much reduced mowing and encouraging wildflowers, but others, not so much. And uh, it's still common to see this kind of thing in our urban areas. Uh, this was some uh, probably grasses and perhaps a few dandelions and whatnot, we'll never know now, growing around a silver birch tree. This was actually in Christchurch in Dorset, but this is quite a common sight around the country. Um, it's been sprayed off by the local council. Many councils employ teams of men to um, drive around looking for anything green, and if they see it, they jump out and kill it with herbicide. Um, seems like entirely unnecessary environmental vandalism to me what harm was that greenery doing it certainly doesn't look better like that um, and what's more the the chemical involved um is almost always round up with the active ingredient glyphosate which is a notorious chemical there's lots of evidence that it's harmful to the soil to wildlife and pretty clear evidence that it causes cancer in people uh, and yet we spray it in our streets that seems pretty bonkers i've even seen it being sprayed on children's play equipment in in parks uh, why would we want to do that all in the name of tidiness personally i would i would suggest we should campaign to ban pesticides completely in our gardens and in our urban areas we don't need them um, and if you don't believe me look to france where in 2018 they did exactly that france wide paris is now basically pesticide free um, if paris can be then why can't everywhere um, i would argue um, that would be a really simple win. Maybe you don't use pesticides in your garden. You might manage it organically. Um, if you do, just be aware that the beautiful flowers on sale in your local garden centre, even the ones with bee-friendly stickers or the RHS Perfect for Pollinator logo, are almost certainly full of insecticides and other pesticides. And I say that because we tested them a few years ago now. Um, uh, and... Um, 98% of the plants we tested contained pesticides. Most of them contained insecticides, which kill insects, and they're being sold as bee-friendly. So beware, um, grow from seed or find an organic nursery if you can. Then one final warning while I'm rambling on about pesticides, you may wonder at the relevance of this, but bear with me. Um, many of us avoid pesticides, but have a pet dog or cat and feel obliged because our vet recommends it to treat them with flea and tick treatments that you drip on the neck of your dog once a month or your cat or even your rabbit. Um, these are really potent neurotoxic insecticides. The one on the left there, Advocate, is based on imidacloprid, uh, which is a, a neonicotinoid insecticide banned in farming, but you can still drip it on your dog. Um, now, and the one on the right is something called fipronil, which is also um, very, very toxic to insect life. We recently published a study where we found both of these chemicals in 100% in of English rivers, um, almost certainly originating from use on pets. Um, so think twice before you pour insecticide onto your family pet. To wrap up. I think we kind of need to try and rewild ourselves a bit as well as our gardens. Uh, we need to, to reconnect with nature and, and relearn to, to respect the other creatures with which we share our planet and, and ideally to promote and encourage everybody to, to love nature. Um, you know, we don't often think about it, but we do live on a rock hurtling through space. It's completely bonkers if you stop to think about it. Um, with this crust of life clinging to its surface, mostly different types of, of insect. Um, yeah, we are being 
terribly reckless with our beautiful planet and it really worries me that you know i've got kids and and uh, what will their kids grow up in you know will they grow up in a world where they never see butterflies and bumblebees and so on i really hope not we'd all do anything wouldn't we for our children um apart from apparently leave them a decent planet to live on how bonkers is that um so we can do better i'm sure and a really easy place to start is by looking after all these little insects that live all around us okay thank you very much for bearing with me thank you very much dave um for a hugely absorbing talk um it's always as enjoyable and inspiring to hear you talk as it is to read your fabulous books which i really heartily recommend um we should though thank you probably above all for being such an effective champion for our neglected insects um it's just it is formidable what you've achieved i can say from the hat i previously wore uh, directing policy and strategy for the Soil Association, I was very aware of the impact that uh, the report that you wrote uh, for the Wildlife Trust had on the policy agenda, really uh, putting insect decline up the agenda um, and securing that focus on farming transformation, um, which we're now seeing with a, with a whole new consensus around food farming and nature. I really would put a lot of that at your door um, and it was no accident that the Wildlife Trust came to you to write that report. Um, so thank you um, on so many fronts. Now I've got lots of questions that have come in um, for you and I've got a chance to ask you a few. Um, starting with a very specific and this one um, I was intrigued by as well, which is a question about the shrill, that lovely shrill cardaby. Why the decline on Salisbury Plain um, where there are no farming inputs or, or, or chemicals being applied? What's going on there? So I think the honest truth is we don't really know. It seemed like the habitat was never optimal for it there because it, it, so far as we know, it was never really common there. Um, but why it disappeared, given it's such a large area and it's protected, is unclear. Um, one thing we do know is that um, bumblebees, so that because they're social insects and only the queen reproduces, they have quite a small population size. Is the, the the workers don't contribute to the next generation. So in sort of genetic terms, as it were, the population size is the number of nests, the number of queens that produce offspring. And we know that organisms need a population size of at least. 50 breeding individuals is the absolute tiniest a population can get before it becomes inbred and collapses. Um, and so social insects like bumblebees have this problem that, that unless there's ideally hundreds of nests, which means very large areas of optimal habitat, then they can't persist long term. So it may just be that, that they became inbred because Salisbury Plain is completely isolated from any other population of shrill carder. But we don't honestly know for sure. So as you say, another example of why uh, we can't have these isolated protective sites um, on their own without that wider farming transformation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Connecting everything up is, is really key if we can. Are there any insect populations that are increasing? Was another question that's coming. Yeah, I, I, some of them not necessarily welcome ones, but the, yeah, I mean, we've had um, there are so many, there are always going to be some which are on the, on the rise, although so, you know, the majority seem to be declining. There are some nice success stories, things like the tree bumblebee and uh, the ivy bee, both of which arrived uh, within the last 20 or so years. Now, so far as we know, natural colonizations from Europe uh, and are spreading northwards and thriving. Uh, which is really interesting you know we, we we often fail to understand why some species seem to um book the trend um and you know what's what's going on with them the comma but i'm taking a longer time period for example comma butterflies were were scarce insects in the first half of the 20th century and they're much more widespread now than they were uh, so that there is odd and really interesting examples of some insects that are doing just fine we had a question about um, what kind of a year it's been for insects this year. Um, so we've had some challenging weather during the spring, which appeared to affect the number of insects. Was that the case? Um, and what, if anything, can we do to support our overwintering insects now? Uh, oh, two things there. So 
I mean, yes, it, it seems like every year is weird these days, weather-wise. And of course, you know, the weather's always unpredictable and unreliable. Um, but insects have coped with that for millennia. Um, what they haven't had to cope with is such rapid change and such extreme weather events, which are undoubtedly contributing to their problems. You know, things like the drought we had last summer. We know bumblebee populations crashed late summer last year because plants just stopped flowering because they had no water. Um, and that then led to a poor spring for, for bumblebee populations this year, presumably because many of the nests failed last year. But then they they seem to recover a bit uh, during during the spring, and actually, I think overall it's not been a a, a terrible year. I mean, it's it's it, and I, I guess it's it, we shouldn't pay too much attention to the short term blips. It's the long term pattern that really matters. Um, in terms of what you can do in your garden or to you know to look after insects over the winter, and the simple thing is uh, really the only thing I think is. Just don't be too tidy minded in your garden, you know, leave the deadheading until the spring when the plants are starting to grow again. Don't chop everything down now because all those herbaceous flowers, uh, that's where insects are overwintering, or many of them. Um, so just, you know, do the, the least you can over the winter in your garden. And that's the best thing you can do for wildlife, I think. I certainly like to take that as my mantra to do the least I can and leave it. Um, Claim it's in the name of uh, conservation, yeah. Yes, thank you for that excuse. Um, do you have any council examples of councils who have really embraced uh, wildflower verges um, or any case studies? Uh, the, the, our listener was asking, is there any great example we can point to our local council grounds teams to? Yeah, so so that I showed a picture of a road verge with lots of wildflowers sewn along the side of it. That was it's a bit of a way from Wiltshire, but that was in Stirling in Scotland, uh, where I, I I worked and lived for a while. Um, and there, there's a there's a a, a local kind of group of volunteers um, called they call themselves On the Verge, and they basically they persuaded the council to let them dig over any bit of amenity grassland that the council sort of didn't mind them sowing with wildflowers. Um, and the last last count, there was something like 90 patches dotted around Stirling um, of, of wildflower mixes that this group had sown. And the, they inspired on the, on the verge Cambridge, which sprang up um, a couple of years ago, who were doing exactly the same thing in Cambridge. And then there was On the Verge Seaford appeared um, uh, nearer to me down in Sussex um, just last year. So it's kind of it's 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 reproducing and spreading. And I think it'd be great if every town had a little group doing exactly that, badgering the council, persuading them to let them sow wildflower seed mixes and change the way they manage the verges. Um, so, yeah, there are there are. And if you want to find out more, you know, getting about how they did it, um, then I'm sure they'd welcome people getting in touch and you could start your own um, Wiltshire branch of, of On The Verge. That would be really cool. I'll be sure to mention I'm seeing the Wiltshire Council's Environment Director tomorrow, so I'll make sure I mention that one. Um, and on that one, so what are the most important policy changes, the question we've uh, had, that you think that UK government should make uh, to help conserve and restore insect populations? Well, so where do we start? Um, off the top of my head, the obvious thing which they need to sort out is ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, which when it was first um, uh, sort of mooted by Michael Gove a good few years ago now, I thought it sounded brilliant. Um, I and mean, it was the most exciting thing I'd heard in years from a British government. Um, actually talking about, you know, really substantially changing the whole subsidy system, putting all the farming subsidies into, into farmers delivering public goods, which essentially I, I understood to mean looking after nature, essentially. Um, but it seems to be not working. Hardly any farmers have signed up. It's, a lot of it's been delayed. We've only kind of got the first stage of it rolled out. And I, I think something like 4,000 farmers in total have enrolled um, which is which is I think about four percent of English farmers, which is hopeless. Um, and I, I really don't believe the government now, since Michael Gove moved on, has any real enthusiasm for for elms at all. They see it seems to have stalled, partly no doubt due to lobbying from the agrochemical industry and so on too. So 
it's they need to push that through they need to try and get it back to where it's where it came from and properly enact what they promised in the first place that's and then on a really tiny one if i can add one more thing on on policy front um for the last Four years, I think, the government has granted derogations to sugar beet farmers um, to use neonicotinoids, which are now outright banned across the whole of Europe. Um, Britain is now the only country in Europe using these highly toxic insecticides that are really persistent in the soil, get into nectar of flowers and so on. Um, uh, so it's almost certainly the case that right now, um the agri the agricultural industry will have applied for another um, um permission for using neonics again in the spring of 2024 that'll be in process now and will be reviewed by government in the next few weeks probably um if anyone's got any influence if you fancy badgering your local mp to shout about this there are various campaigns underway to try and ask the government not to grant another derogation and you know not to make Britain the, the dirty man of Europe when it comes to pesticides, which is is a real danger with Brexit. You know, we, if they start deregulating and allowing banned pesticides back, that could be disastrous. Agreed, agreed. Um, last question then, what is the most effective thing uh, you think that the Wildlife Trust can do to make a difference to insects in Wiltshire? Oh, crikey. Um, well, I mean, as I don't want to don't want to sound um, um, uh, like I'm being o overly kind or whatever, but uh, it does seem like you're doing a lot al already. Um, I, I, I guess the the big the biggest challenge for me, I think the biggest thing you could do if I had to pick one thing would be to focus on supporting farmers. You know, Wiltshire is a very it has a huge area, a very large proportion of farmland overall britain is 70 percent farmland so unless we can get that right what we do on our nature reserves and in our gardens is is actually honest truth not going to be enough um if the, if 70 percent of the landscape is hostile um so as i mentioned in in the talk you know supporting farmers that really want to adopt and embrace nature friendly farming methods with or without the help of government which you know we it would be nice if elms was there to support farmers doing all of this but if it's not then we need to help them in other ways and so that's for me if i had to pick one thing I, what i would suggest you should focus your efforts on well i'm really delighted to hear you say that because that uh, is certainly supporting those nature-friendly farmers is a big focus for our new strategy um, and it's what gives me hope um those those farmers who really do identify with being you know, farming for and with nature um, at the same time as, as obviously you know having a sustainable livelihood but they're proving it's possible um, and yeah, yeah, you know, there are, very much there need to get behind really, them. Really exciting things happening in the world of farming you know some farmers have really embraced this and want to move forward and um, so yeah we just need to help them. Fantastic thank you so much Dave from all of us uh, and I'm going to hand back now to Mark for the rest of the AGM. Thank you, Joe. Um, and thank you, Dave. Yeah, totally inspiring. And uh, more action to come from all of us, I think, and obviously from the Wildlife Trust movement overall. So uh, let's carry on now with the presentation. Uh, so we've got uh, a session now for, for uh, questions that members have submitted as uh, part of your voting, part of your response online to the AGM invitation. And thank you very much for those. They're very helpful. We have had a significant number, probably more than we can actually uh, answer today. What I'm going to do is group some together and, and ask some of the senior leadership team to, to join with me to answer those. Um, if you don't get a direct answer, the senior leadership team will help uh, prepare answers as well. So you will receive something um, if you don't get your answer this evening. Um, also, really like to, to thank members for their kind comments about the Trust. It's always really great to hear that feedback. And also for wishing um, Jo good luck in her new role. And we all do that. And we're really looking forward to getting into delivering our strategy with Joe's leadership. And I think that's a, a fantastic 
uh, opportunity that we've got now. Um, but also uh, a lot of thank yous for Gary Mantle. And um, I'm sure we wouldn't be doing what we're doing tonight. And you wouldn't have seen the results. You wouldn't have seen um, the work, the outcomes, if it hadn't have been for Gary's leadership. And I know on my behalf and on behalf of the trustees, we do express a huge amount of thanks and gratitude to Gary for all the work he's done over the last 33 years. Literally, um, the, the, the Wiltshire Wildlife Trust would not look the same. But we have a challenge. That challenge remains. And as I say, we're looking forward to, to working with Joe and the senior leadership team and the rest of the staff to carry on investing in charitable funds. OK, so... There have been a, quite a lot of questions in about water companies, as you might imagine, and how they're held accountable for their actions. Sam, I wonder if you'd be able to, to help us with that question, please. Thank you, Mark. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Stork. I'm the Head of Conservation here at the Wildlife Trust. So Wiltshire Wildlife Trust is very active with engaging with campaigns and lobbying to improve water quality and quantity within our rivers. We do this nationally, part of the National Wildlife Trust movement, and we do it locally. Uh, an example from last week, our water team manager, Alice, met with MPs at a parliamentary reception in Westminster, focused on chalk streams. And we also promote and host visits to the water treatment reed bed that we have at Langford Lakes, for example. The reed bed at Langford treats pumped water, removing chemicals and pollutants prior to water being discharged to the River Wiley. It's actually being refurbished and improved by Wessex Water in 2025. But in the meantime, we are installing real time water quality monitors on that reed bed so we can get a better picture of how it really is performing to improve work to that reed bed, but also the design of others going forward into the future. And it's a really good example, I think, of how in addition to campaigning and lobbying um, with water com companies and with government, we really believe that we need to work with water companies to help speed up environmental improvements. So along those lines, we are working actively with Wessex Water at the moment to provide treatment for groundwater storm overflows using nature-based solutions. Um, by that, um, nature-based solutions, I just mean looking at how we can use nature to solve human challenges. So there are a number of other areas, in addition to Langford in Wiltshire, where we are progressing with designs for similar schemes, working with Wessex Water. Um, if you want to see for yourself what is happening in the Wessex Water region, um, Wessex Water has a storm overflow dashboard. It's on its website, but I trialled this morning. And honestly, the best way to find it is Google Wessex Water storm overflow dashboard and it will come up as one of the top results through Google and you can get to it there so you can see um, what's happening in Wiltshire. Um, so that's just some examples I hope uh, being trying to be concise uh, with all the work that we're doing of how we're being vocal about the key issues, uh, we're working with water companies and really it's about providing real examples on the ground and case studies which heads of water companies can visit and do visit, off what can visit, MPs can visit to see um, what we're doing, how it's being monitored and how it can be replicated in other areas, which is really important. Um, I think it's also, we need to recognise not all pollution results in the action of water companies. We have a number of projects working with landowners and farmers to tackle runoff from agricultural land, mapping flow pathways, tree planting, creating buffer strips and creating lots of wetlands and river re-meandering. Um, and we had a few questions about how we're working across county boundary with improving our river catchments. We are members of the catchment partnerships. We have really, really close working relationships with our neighbouring wildlife trust, but also we are joint pro project partners with Bristol Avon Rivers Trust, Wessex Rivers Trust, and the Wild Trout Trust. So we work with all the other NGOs and organisations across our county boundary to take that catchment approach. Um, so uh, there are a few questions which I think I probably haven't directly answered here, but I can answer those directly personally. Um, but what I did want to finish by highlighting 
is at Wiltshire Wildlife Trust, we have a dedicated water team, which is one of the best nationally in the Wildlife Trust movement. We've got five members of staff in that team entirely focusing on improving our waterways within the county. Uh, it's something that Wildlife Trust at Wiltshire, we're really, really proud of and we're continuing to expand and improve. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Sam. That's really helpful and uh, very comprehensive. The next question I'm going to deal with um, is uh, asked, which is uh, what plans are in place to promote diversity within the Board of Trustees? And this is always a, a challenging um, situation, a challenging question, really. But I'm, I'm, this is why I, I want to, to, to deal with it this evening. Um, first of all is knowledge. Uh, so uh, training is very important. So I personally am going on um, some inclusivity training, which starts tomorrow, which is, I'm really looking forward to. But also um, we are in the new year going to be launching uh, a, a recruitment campaign, which um, people tonight might be interested in, in looking at. And that is to secure some new trustees, including a president, uh, a new treasurer and um, later in the year we'll need someone to become the new chair of trustees and so by doing a wider externally supported recruitment campaign I really feel that we can promote what this is what the type of, of volunteering opportunities you have as a, as a trustee to to the community of Wil Wiltshire as a whole so that is one really important thing that you need to look out for early in 2024. Obviously, we can always do more. And I know there are champions within the, the trust movement itself. So uh, we're working both from the inside and then hopefully um, working from an external point of view as well. OK, uh, Sam, there is another question for you. It's quite a specific one. Um, can you provide an update on the paths at Lower Moor? farm and their accessibility for wheelchair users goodness yes i definitely can i'm happy that i can so anyone who's visited Lermor farm recently will know uh how muddy and challenging the path particularly in between the two lakes has become in wet weather um the complication slightly has been the site has been designated as a site of special scientific interest is triple si so we've had to get consent for the repair and all the materials that we want to use in that repair so um extending the boardwalk through that area has not been possible so we, we do have consent for a gravel path through there that will really improve access um for most people but I do appreciate that gravel is or can be far from ideal um, for wheelchair access and can make that really challenging. Um, so we need to repeat the re complete the repair as soon as we can to solve the immediate issue and stop the path degrading. But we will then need to continue to look at what is possible in terms of providing easy wheelchair access through to that second hide around the lake, which I know is the thing that the most people are asking for is just to get to that second bird hide round. So we, we we're aware and we're going to need to continue to look at it. Um, in terms of time scale, everything's in place. We're just waiting for a date for when the contractor can start, but it'll be this year that path is improved. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thank you. And uh, Sam, you again, uh, last question. Um, this is a wider, more policy-based question. Uh, can you confirm um, whether we're giving sufficient regard uh, to environmental factors in the Wiltshire local plan, which is very active at the moment. And there's been a series of, of uh, consultation events across the county. But can you just give us a bit of a uh, an insight into what, what we're doing as a wildlife trust, please? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Mark. So um, the consultation on the Wiltshire local plan ends on the 22nd of November. Um, we are responding. It's something that's live on my desk right now, which is a professional way of trying to say that I'm still reading through and working on it so I can't share with you now our full response but as we work through when we finish that response we'll certainly be um, using our comms channels to and the e-newsletter social media to highlight any key points we feel are important um, however uh, I can say a few things which is we are working very closely with Wiltshire Council 
on the local nature recovery strategy, which includes mapping nature recovery networks throughout the county. Um, the local plan does refer to this strategy and we'll definitely be emphasising the importance of the local nature recovery strategy um, in the local plan. So all policies, regard, be they biodiversity offsetting, habitat creation, tree planting, they need to take full advantage of the strategy to ensure they're strategic and effective. There's a lot of good data and information going into that strategy and um, it'll be a good resource going forwards. Uh, we'll be looking for clear recognition of irreplaceable habitats. We think that's important and that it's not just about preservation, but also seizing opportunities to restore areas and improve existing habitat. I suppose in line with what I was just speaking about a moment ago, we will definitely be looking in detail what the plan has to say about Wiltshire's river catchments. Uh, from what I've seen so far, I think it looks like we'll be looking for stronger commitment to protecting the freshwater systems, securing them as effective corridors for wildlife through our landscape. Um, just as an example, um, let's talk about buffer zones between development and river corridors. And from experience, I think we found that actually the definition of what a wide buffer zone could be between those two areas is open to interpretation. And if we're looking for a buffer zone to host um, and provide space for public access, as well as wildlife refuge, water retention, pollution prevention, that actually we need to make sure those are actually large enough and designed in such a way that they can deliver on all of those. Um, so those are the key points we're working on at the moment. But as I said, as we finish reading through and putting our response together, we'll use our comms channels to communicate anything that we feel is important for people to know and highlight in their responses. Thanks. Excellent. That's a really good response, but still a lot to go, I think, on that. OK, um, Joe, there was a question for you on Menti earlier there uh, through uh, Dave's presentation. So. Um, I don't have the question in front of me, but I understand the reason. Yes. Over to you. Thanks. Well, yes, I just wanted to make sure uh, I've had a, an opportunity to respond to a question which came through to me from um, a mentee uh, asking, how do I submit uh, records of species that I've counted in my own garden to Wiltshire Wildlife Trust? And um, you'll have seen in the video that we showed earlier uh, we're fortunate enough at Wiltshire Wildlife Trust to have our own record centre, so the Wiltshire and Swindon Biological Record Centre um, here within the Trust, and they record and analyse and map huge uh, volumes of data about species and about habitats, um, and they really do welcome all your records. So if you go to, um, again, the easiest way to, to get there is probably to Google uh, WSBRC or Wiltshire and Swindon Biological Record Centre um, or you can find it under what we do on our own Wiltshire Wildlife Trust website um, and that record centre website sets out really clearly how you can share your records so please do and thanks for the question. Good, good practical one and actually brings us to the end of our, um, our AGM for this evening and uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved tonight, um, both in preparation, the delivery. Thank you, Dave, so much for, for your talk. Thank you to everyone who put the wonderful video together. Um, it is inspiring, which is why we do what we do. Um, and thank you to our supporters and those of you who are here listening in live tonight for taking the time this evening to, to find out what we do. And um, I hope to be able to see some of you in the coming year. Um, the activity will not stop. We we continue continue to punch well above our weight. And I can assure you that um, we're all committed to making Wiltshire a better place. So um, thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest.